Hello to the chicos and the chicas. Excitement levels are through the roof because I'm going to talk about a topic that is particularly close to my heart and that is going to be none other than when is it okay to move pawns in front of our king. And before I say a single word more on the topic I'm going to tell you that there is a lot more to be found on this in my chess principles reloaded king safety course so I would like to direct your attention to that which also can be found in the description of this video but now I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a taste of uh, this topic in general most amateur club level players feel extremely reluctant engaging in any kind of combative chess that includes moving pawns in front of their king, um, most of the times they would label certain moves that are happening in front of the king as one that they would have never even considered. And I think that this game and this position is going to fit that bill perfectly. So I'm going to uh, show you what I talk about through a marvelous game where in the white trunks we have got none other than probably the best candidate for the GOAT title alongside Magnus Carlsen and that is Gary Kasparov and his opponent is uh, a well-known dude from the 70s, 80s by the name Yurtaev. The opening is a mainline Nimzo. Uh, the young Kasparov already knew how to play proper chess. E3 Nimzo is the way to go. Um, takes d5, takes d5, knight e2 and now we are entering a very famous and uh, well discussed structure, in fact two of them. At first it looks like a Karlsbad, where in fact white is not really well off with the bishop being here. Bishop here would be a proper queen's gambit declined Karlsbad, but here uh, we have got something else to offer as far as the, uh, the structure is concerned, and that is going to be f3 when white is looking to expand in the center with e4. And all of a sudden a very thematic fight ensues where black goes like mm -mm, no to e4 by charging at the center at this point i would like to highlight that 97 was premature because in this c5 setups you would want the knight to be on c6 hence uh c6 is a better way to go uh earlier on according to the modern theory because once again in this setup the knight on c6 is just so much uh, better placed, it contests the center, it keeps the bishop's diagonal open, and so on. So, a3, takes d4, takes d4, bishop e7, and uh, lo and behold, we have a very odd outcome from this opening. The structure is stock standard, and in fact, you would find this setup discussed in lots of chess books. Um, but who would have thought that from this position, we would end up in a symmetrical pawn structure like that? Uh, it looks now, as per chat, indicating indeed um, an exchange French. Uh, it does look like many variations that actually occur from the E3 Nimzo. Note, by the way, the humble moment with the mug. Cheers. Yeah, just, just saying. So, black plate here, knight b8, following my instructions, uh, because the knight stands better on uh, c6. D5 pawn needed uh, guidance, guide, gardens, guardianship, whatever. It needed to be protected is what I'm trying to say. And here comes the moment where I think the vast majority of people uh, on club level and thereabouts would choose candidate moves such as bishop e3, maybe bishop c2, maybe rook e1, and that's... I would say about the size of it. The engine loves bishop e3. I really don't like the look of it. I like bishop c2 a lot. The engine sort of approves of it. And of course, Kasparov here uncorked the absolutely awesome g4. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we arrive at the very topic of our video. Now, what is that makes this move absolutely okay and in fact good, even though it opens up the king? Now, first and foremost, g4 introduces the immediate threat of g5, which kicks the knight, weakens the pawn on d5, and at the same time, whilst this king has become more airy, it certainly hasn't become weaker because the black pieces has have no potential whatsoever to get to this king. 
So uh, this poor move, g4 here, is definitely one that uh, I would really like you to try to not remember. That doesn't help at all to understand, to get a bit of a grasp on what's going on. Note that another thing that helps this to be an effective and successful measure is the fact that we have a pawn on f3, which cancels out knight e4. And that's a super important measure because if we didn't have that, then after g5, even at a cost of a pawn, black would throw knight e4 in. And uh, after take, 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 black would have plenty of counterplay because the position blast all, blasts open, d4 is weak. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of counterplay. But as is, there is not really an adequate response against g5. The game featured bishop d6. Uh, h6 is an interesting idea here. And I would really like to again show you here uh, the subtlety of thinking and the depth of thinking uh, in case of, uh, or rather in, in White's um, setup or layout or the way how this is being played. So what's going on here is that Bishop C2 followed by Queen D3. So let's just play a few pass moves to demonstrate the point. Creates the deadly threat of Knight F takes D5 or CD in fact, and the Knight can't take because this is mate. However, this operation is reasonably well dealt with by the move g6, which allows white black even to create uh, a follow-up threat with bishop f5. So now if we rewind the tape to g4, we realized what a genius move it is, because after h6, if we recreate the same scenario, g6 is no longer playable due to knight takes g6, and uh, white comes in with absolutely yeah, destructive um, attack. So this is just pff, done and dusted. The game is over. So the main threat remains to be g5, but h6 is not an effective measure against it. Now, the engine's favorite move is to let this go by knight c6. And here, typically, by the way, the best response is to hold. Not to engage too soon, but to hold and build. Very cool chess on both sides. G5 now uh, is not that great because knight d7 and all of a sudden the structure is falling apart because the pawn went too far and uh, it's going to drop if you play h4, the knight b6. And now this has become loose without yielding any benefits. Even now, white is not worse, but this looks like we haven't accomplished what we wanted. So here it is wiser to first build, build, and then go, go in for g5. Very awesome chess. Now, Yurtai have decided to apply an altogether different measure, which looks supremely ugly to my eyes. And that was, was that after g5, he would want to take on here and then drop the knight to h5. Uh, g5 here takes, takes, and knight h5. And Kasparov saw this, by the way. I don't like this, but it works for the time being. And he decided to meet this with King H1, which at first sight looks like a really loose move that does absolutely nothing. But actually, this is a really clever idea. And uh, the point of this move will be obvious uh, after the um, text that was played in the game. Rook E8. And here too, by the way, apart from G5, we would have had Rook G1. An odd move at first sight, but this also supports the attack. Uh, but I want to show you how the game went because I love this. G5 takes, takes, knight h5. And now it looks like we are in a bit of a pickle because the bishop wouldn't really want to come back. I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, bishop retreat looks ugly because the knight c6. And again, the knight on h5 turns out to be a good piece. So what did Kasparov do here? The most shocking move, really. But it's a work of a genius. Takes b8. Now, if anyone played this, I would actually reprimand them. And in fact, the engine does too. But the idea is so beautiful behind this. I can't stop but adore it. Rook takes b8, f4. And the pawns keep on rolling up, exposing new targets. And now after g6, queen f3 we find ourselves in a position which is structurally, and this is really funny, 
because it seems like we are lunging forward with the pawns to create a deadly attack. But in the meantime, we created a position that I think is better looking for white at least in positional terms, which is that all the pawns that are fixed are on white, the color of the bishop. And so transitioning into end games will heavily favor white now. That being said, the most tenacious defensive measure knight g7 would have left this position in balance. The most accurate measure instead of bishop b8, despite me calling it genius, was bishop e5, retaining the tension, tempting black to take when we have got a huge attack on the g file. Or if knight c6, then indeed f4, cementing the bishop on e5 and hitting the knight on h5. And again, note that seemingly this king is extremely airy. And yet, even if I gave you 10 moves in a row with black where you can't capture, it's incredibly difficult to see how black could get to this king at all. Um, yeah, queen takes g5, I think rook g1, queen h4 and knight takes d5. And uh, yeah, good luck Chuck holding this. This this just looks miserable for black. There, is a, there are so many various threats um, pending that uh, it is a nightmare to play something like this for black, that's for sure. But let's proceed with the game. So the bishop takes, takes f4, g6, queen f3, b6. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is more or less the decisive mistake, despite being a very logical move. Because now knight d5, bishop b7, and the table's turn. And many a player would say, see, you shouldn't have moved those pawns. Nah, chess not. That's not how chess works. Because that's a one-move blunder, and that's not a result of the pawn push at all. And in fact, of course, Kasparov, a seasoned grandmaster by the time of the game, 1981, continued his attack by pushing those pawns further and further up. And again, we are hanging g5. But queen takes g5 is of course not playable due to f takes g6 followed by queen f7. C yeah, wouldn't want to be out. Yeah, the game is over. And of course f5 is also immune to capture because after take take the knight is hanging on h5. And so the pawns keep on rolling up, gaining space, creating a lot of uh, danger around the black king. Did you notice that so far I modeled to you many many lines in which the black king got into a lot of trouble and only one where it was the white king that was on the menu, and that was a one-move blunder. So it is definitely crystal clear that here, the only king that is feeling very nervous is the black one. And actually, I would like to take it back because I would like to mention a psychological point, which a lot of club-level players seem to not understand or not take on board when they evaluate moves like g4. They say, I, there is no way I would even consider that move, which to some degree I am happy to accept. However, when shown, they are still reluctant to accept that this is the way to go. And then when I go like, okay, how do you feel here with black? And they go like, well, it's actually pretty sucky. I, I don't like it. But you just said you didn't like G4. And so there comes this very strange uh, antagonism or conflict where we, we come to a point where we don't like G4, but we also don't like to defend it. And so this is a textbook case of uh, having trying to, you know, have the cake and eat it too. Like you have to pick a side, man uh, and ladies. We need to figure out which one is right. And it turns out that after G4, the discomfort that black experience is here is actually far greater than the initial discomfort, that shouldn't be there at all, by the way, that we feel when we lunge forward in front of the king like that. But it is actually based on a sound position, sound concept, sound moves, and therefore the whole idea is extremely powerful. So, back to game. F5, rook b7. F6. Now, this is a positional twist, in my opinion, which basically is aimed at killing the knight. No squares anymore. And the black king is still in a lot of hurt because the back rank is really questionable how it is going to be, you know, held together, especially having played rook b7, which kind of disconnected the rocks. Bishop e6, rook e1, great chess. Queen d6, and rook e5. 
a beautiful demonstration of bring all the boys to the party development and centralized pieces so my cpr courses here are all on display center development and king safety um rook d8 and here kasparov went for a very very basic plan which i like a lot which is queen e3 bishop e2 for those who enjoy tactical skirmishes i would like to show you this little qt with bishop f5 where after bishop takes f5 we have rook d5 and it turns out that we pick off the rook in the end the engine is a cruel one to find these but queen e3 i think is a lot more human and a lot easier to understand because now there is it feels like we are risking a lot with bishop f5 for no need where in fact we can just eliminate this and walk away with the w b4 take 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 and at this point kasparov pulled off a beautiful absolutely beautiful tactical finish i tweeted this a couple of days in fact probably a week ago because there is a, a marvelous uh tactic and calculating exercise to be had because after g6 with the idea of bringing the queen in we have got two ways to go here rook e6 and rook h5 and in fact i used this very position with a student of mine a couple of days ago as a calculating exercise to figure out which one is right and which one is wrong um and interestingly enough almost everyone gets it right that rook takes e6 is the win but almost everyone gets it wrong why rook h5 isn't good enough so I'm going to show you both. The game ended rook e6, f, uh, fe6, queen h6, rook b7, and queen takes g6. Check wasn't even played. Yurtaev resigned. Because after either king move, uh, f7 is absolutely terminal. Mate, mate, mate everywhere. So that's just game over. And likewise here, it is simply not holdable. And uh, black is going to lose. King e7. Um... F8 is actually not winning here because rook f8, queen check, king e8, rook f8, queen f8, queen takes his mate down on f1, but knight a4 first and knight c5 is uh, absolutely brutal. So this is game over too. Uh, and the cute variation, and if you want to, you can pause the video and figure it out yourself. I thought rook h5 was winning, right? With the idea of taking then queen h5, uh, h6, excuse me, with mate. Not check, because then the king runs. But I thought that the idea was to come here. And after queen f8 check. And after bishop g4 queen h5. And of course it is clear as day to see here that rook takes d4 holds. But when you are calculating it from uh, this position. Rook d4 is an easy move to overlook that it defends the bishop on g4. So take take queen h6 is in fact not winning this way. I will show you some shocking stuff afterward. Because rook d4, rook takes, rook takes, queen takes, and king h7, and there is no mate. Turns out, though, that after rook h5, g h5, knight e4, seven exclamation marks, still wins the game. Wow. Because the idea is that now we blocked off the four rank. So after queen h6 here and here, can we go rook g1? Yeah, rook g1 also works. And now the rook can't defend the bishop. Chess is absolutely beautiful. Wow. So, yeah, that was uh, Kasparov Yurtaev one more time. This is how it all ended. And that is where Yurtaev resigned before allowing queen takes g6. So, if we go back to g4, let's give a bit of a summary and a bit of a takeaway for everybody about why this is a great move and what makes it work. Number one. Superior development ensures that black can't really throw any kinds of spanner in the works. Our plan is rolling forward without, you know, having to worry about much. That's definitely number one. Two, it is difficult to see or understand at first. But despite the fact that the center is not a closed pawn structure, the way how the pieces are laid out means that there is very little chance for conflict in the middle of the board. There are no pawn breaks. There are no trades available. Right now and in the foreseeable future. Next two, three, four, five moves. And that takes a very good chess player to recognize that, right? Because a lunge forward like this, when we have a completely sealed center with the pawn chains hugging each other, we know that nothing can hurt us. 
but recognizing that although this central formation is very open, it's still not allowing black to counterpunch is a very cool idea. And it indeed does take a next level chess player to immediately go like, yep, this is closed enough for it to succeed. Free. G5 is not the main threat. So whilst G5 is a vital part of the operation, the idea is that G5 creates multiple added tactical opportunities for white. So G4 is almost like it's uh, actually uh, just a means, but not the end, or G4, G5. We are using this to create further chaos, further problems on the chessboard. And last but not least, uh, the good old adage is that this move does not weaken the white king unless black pieces have realistic chance to get close to it. And that is certainly not the case. And in fact, many a variation in this game, uh, the time model you including the bishop e5 knight here f4 one shows that whilst the pawns are rolling forward, the situation becomes more and more dire around the black king, not around this guy here. He's very happy and safe here. This guy is being nervous about the oncoming storm with the various tactical ideas that are at play already. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the Kasparov Yurtaev game. And that was the topic of when is it okay to push your pawns in front of your king. I hope that this was a good introduction to the theme. Of course, a lot more games, a lot more analysis needs to be done and seen for you to feel fully empowered. But I think that this is really a great starting point. On that note, I'm going to call it a day. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to sub to like, to super like or super thank. And I will be back with the next video soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.